Welcome to today's webinar. The topic for today is COVID-19 CMS Focus Survey and Senior Living Response. My name is Savannah Roman, and I will be facilitating today's meeting. If you have any questions during today's presentation, please send them to webinars at directsupply.com. Please note, the information contained in this presentation is intended to provide general information, but not advice about certain regulations and initiatives. This is not intended as legal or other advice, and each situation may vary depending on the particular facts and circumstances. You should ensure compliance with your unique building, locality, and licensing considerations, and consult with your compliance and legal team. This webinar will be recorded today. Today's webinar will be presented by Ken Daly, LNHA and founder of Elder Care Assistance Group. Ken has a long track record of leading people, building teams, and recommending best practices, quality control, and fiscal accountability for healthcare programs. With the recent implementation of CMS's emergency preparedness mandate, Ken has worked with hundreds of facilities and individuals focused on being better prepared for those things we cannot control. As Ken has said many times, you cannot control the environment, but we can control the facility response. Today, Ken is one of the leading life safety experts focused on senior living and works throughout the country on life safety and emergency preparedness. Ken has served nearly 20 years on the Ohio Healthcare Association Board of Trustees. Ken serves as the chair of the Ohio Health, uh, the OHCA's Life Safety and Disaster Management Committee. He also serves on the American Healthcare Association Life Safety and Disaster Management Committee as well as the National Fire Protection Association Health Care Committee and its executive board. A frequent engaging speaker having lectured nationwide at professional conferences, training, and other sponsored events shared insights on long-term care opportunities, quality, survey, disaster management, and life safety code, as well as authoring and editing numerous articles and professional manuals. Now, please welcome Ken. Well, thank you very much, and it's great to be here today with you. Um, as um, as indicated before, if you have any questions, please, we'll show you at the end where you can email them, um, and we will be collating them and getting uh, responses out to everyone. Obviously, we're talking today about COVID-19 and how senior living is really um, under the gun, but how our response to this is critical. Um, and I would tell you a little bit about myself in addition to what the introduction said. I'm coming to you today um, from a skilled nursing home in Western Ohio uh, named Greenville Healthcare and Rehab, a 92 bed facility. Um, and, and unfortunately, uh, we've had a, a COVID-19 outbreak um, and I have been managing that now um, for nearly uh, over three weeks. Uh, we've had uh, more than 40 confirmed cases of the virus uh, with um, 18 residents um, confirmed and um, um, that has resulted in more than um, um, seven confirmed deaths so far. So I certainly understand um, what it takes in terms of operations. Um, I've worked um, with um, our state association. I work closely with my local health department, my local EMA. Um, and a number of individuals um, across the region. And so I'm gonna to try to talk about that today uh, because what our, our, our necessary first thing to think about is that if you're listening to this and you have absolutely no cases um, of COVID-19 in your facility, um, your ultimate goal is to never have one. And it's not just a goal. It means you have to work towards this. You need to work towards this through the adherence to all of the recommendations relative to the use of PPE and screening um, and then response. And so please, please be mindful of that because a single case in your facility um, will many times turn into many more cases. Uh, we don't know, of course, in my center, who is patient zero. Uh, we don't know um, who it was that brought it into our building. Um, and we don't know when this is going to end. Um, over the past few days, there has been somewhat of a lull, but once you understand this or observe this for yourselves, you'll see many patients have minor 
uh, signs and symptoms, low-grade fevers, and that changes over the course of days to weeks. So, so it is something that is that is really, really tough. And of course, if you look at the data, not just from my center, but from across the country and the world, uh, the most vulnerable population is those individuals over age 70. So, so again, most of us in our centers, our populations are that old or older. And so they're just by their very nature of, 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 of advanced age and infirmary become tremendously at risk for the illness um, and this most the worst outcome, which is death. Now, you know, over the over the past several months, um, it's only been a couple months, we've seen this go from really zero to obviously to the hundreds, if not thousands, um, in this country. Um, there are hundreds of skilled nursing centers and long-term care facilities in this country that have now an outbreak um, of the COVID virus. I think the worst case yesterday, a facility in Pennsylvania was seen to have maybe as many as 800 cases um, in their center. But what really is going to be important to look at is obviously the size and the population of each center, um, but really how much the facility takes and internalizes and operationalizes those pieces of advice, whether you hear it from me, whether you've read it from the CDC, from CMS, from your own state um, officials, um, and how vigilant you are. I mean, vigilance every day of every moment is going to be important. I think the reason I, you know, I'm not trying to to focus on Kirkland and what happened there. Um, you know, obviously that was like the first, quote unquote, the first case in this country. Um, and 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 they obviously have had a devastation there um, that is of a magnitude that I would imagine uh, most will not experience. Um, they now, as of uh, April the 9th, they've reported uh, more than 40 deaths um, at that facility. Um, and I wouldn't, again, you don't want to think about blaming them because in the end, there's nothing you can do to stop this. Once you have it in your building, once it is spread, once residents um, um, contract it, um, there's nothing you can do. Um, there is no treatment for this, so so you have to, to power through it, um, as it were, with Tylenol and fluids and comfort care and, and whatever your doctor feels is appropriate, um, but there is no there is no cure, so it is it is tough, but it is clearly important. And looking at what happened um, in the three citations that were were summarized there, uh, the facility failed to rapidly identify and manage, they had to notify the appropriate health department about the increasing problems, um, and then possess a sufficient backup plan, particularly after after their leadership had passed away from the disease. So so. Um, um, that's really what the message is here today, guys, um, and that's what we're going to talk about um, through through this webinar this, this this morning. Obviously, you know everything we have known has changed um, in just a few weeks. We have gone from you know robust um, and, and and busy facilities to where today we we are are locked down, no visitors, no communal dining, no activities of 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 any kind of magnitude. Um, you know, we're, we, we have really changed the nature of, of how we operate. One of the things that has, has come to true, now every state listening, you may have um, specific state waivers, 1135 waivers that have occurred, but we've also seen a number of federal blanket waivers. And what is referred to by a blanket waiver is when it affects every Medicare and Medicaid certified uh, entity in the country including our of all of our protectorates like you know like uh, uh guam and and puerto rico and those places so so we have had a number of blanket waivers and so i just want to touch on those quickly um there's some highlighted ones that i think are important to note um again if there's any information people need you can you can circle back and ask questions relative um to this back to 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 those of us here at, at direct supply and I'll, I'll give you that email at the end of this presentation, because you know, if you need information, please please let us know. But the the important uh, uh, waivers that are out there, and I mean, one of the things, of course, in this country, 
that has been a challenge for for months and months is is the lack of of adequate staff and so so one of the things that came out uh for the last couple of weeks is that cms is waiving the requirement for nurse aid training now they did not waive obviously the, the requirement uh, for nurse aid competency so you still have to do some training uh, but they do not have to be state tested or state certified at this point you could um, send them through a, a much lesser course uh, work at your facility um, they're not going going to school this is not going to cost you anything necessarily um, if you're members of american Healthcare, for instance i think they've published an eight hour training curriculum for nursing assistants in this situation and obviously ultimately you still have to do um, some uh, uh, competencies. So, so again, there's some competency documents out there. There's some, you can use these individuals then as nurse aides, you can use them as hospitality aides. Uh, but the idea is that there is a, a lesser standard today uh, for when we're hiring. And I would encourage you to consider hospitality assistance or additional nursing assistance that may have less training um, in your facilities. Um, this may be a huge opportunity for us to move our organizations forward and provide um, really solid care um, in, in a situation that is an emergency. I believe we've seen the waiving of some resident rights, the resident right to group organization, the resident right to have the room and roommate changes, the residents' rights to, to organize. Um, it's not that we're anti-resident at this point. It's obviously recognizing that because of social distancing requirements, because of the expectations, of, of you know no no communal meals and no activities and groups um they're just waving that we are not going to get cited for failing to meet certification requirements for not holding large group meetings uh, the environmental waivers are really going to be related back to surge plans related to like if facilities um decide to uh um empty a facility for instance and then move use that building as a covid care center um, or, or a unit in your building um, or, or a floor. So you, you may be permitted to move residents and, and, and or use non-typical spaces. Um, last week in this waiver, they said, you know, if you needed to use your dining room, uh, your therapy gym, uh, maybe you have a theater, um, a large space. But I mean, it goes back to some state approvals. It goes back to, to you know, uh, uh, not not making sure residents have inadequate amount of space. Um, but the idea is that it's all really related to, to surge plans, but they, they did have a waiver. Their discharge is related to that as well. Again, residents may not have transfer and discharge rights the same way they do in terms of a hearing process related to if you have a surge plan. Maybe your maybe you're building, believe it or not, I do know of buildings in my own company um, that I'm working for right now. We emptied uh, two facilities uh, totally and combined facilities to maximize resources um, and staffing. And so when we have empty buildings that may be turned over to hospitals to use as COVID care centers. Um, but so transfer and discharge was different. We didn't give 30 day notices to the residents um, and the ombudsman was involved the entire time. But the idea is that that there is there's different transfer and discharge rights. One of the ones that I think we heard about first is a three day hospital stay. Uh, was waived. Obviously, you can take residents straight into your center um, uh, who may not have a three day hospital stay. And there's, you know, all kinds of rules and all kinds of conversation about who is appropriate, when you should do this. And, and I do, this is not the time to talk about that. But there certainly is some rules about that. Uh, the holding off on PASSAR screening, there's a 30 day exemption right now. You can go 30 days without having PASSAR and still receive Medicaid funding. The minimum data set, the 14 day requirement. For submission, I believe was set to 30 days. So there's a little bit of difference in that. And then in terms of data submission, right now it's PBJ for staffing, I believe is on hold. Um, I don't believe we're gonna be sub submitting, um, this is April 1st, April 8th, 9th today. So I think the uh, second quarter of 2020, uh, we may not be having to do PBJ this quarter. Um, I know I'm waiting to, to see some interpretation of what CMS waiver stated, but it's possible that PBJ and the staffing that goes into our five star uh, may be put on hold for for a few days or a few months. Um, I'm actually waiting to see if if, for instance, five star Medicare five star um, is 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 waived for a little while as well. And there's some other waivers. Um, one thing I didn't I didn't see up there on that list yet, and just many of you have asked, um, is life safety code waivers. 
Some of you, like myself, are listening to from states that you are not permitted to have any visitors in your building or only, only essential visitors. So fire inspections related to your set, you know, to your, your rage hood in the kitchen, your sprinkler system, your fire alarm, um, um, in many ways um, has not been waived yet. So you know, your quarterly sprinkler, for instance, is still required. However, um, to be prudent, um, and this is a company policy, I mean, it's up to your company, I would not allow those individuals in our facility. I do believe from a life safety perspective, you should be doing fire drills and all internal inspections um, as you would in any day of the week. So your documentation system is, is mostly maintained, but if it requires an outside vendor um, who would be considered a non-essential visitor at this point, um, I would hold off on those inspections. I do anticipate CMS is issuing a blanket waiver um, in the coming weeks on life safety inspections um, and the requirements, um, but we have not seen that published as of yet. So let's talk about facility plans for this. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of plans. Obviously, um, at, at um, uh, Direct Supply tells there is a ch uh, checklist now, and there's materials that I've created. Um, again, these are just um, examples of policies and procedures relative to COVID virus as an addendum to your emergency preparedness plan. Um, when I was introduced, you know, I've worked with many centers on creating emergency plans. And what I've created is a set of policies and procedures that would be are strictly for the COVID virus. And so it is it is targeted at COVID um, and you're certainly welcome to use those um, and to adopt those, change those um, as, as you wish. So we, we would we would encourage you to, to download those from from the TELS uh, checklist. Um, the very first thing, uh, the very first policy that's in there. Um, and really what start off with, and, and if you look even at the CDC's guidelines for, for, this, for this incident, is that you have to consider who's in charge of the incident. And I would say you need to adopt incident command now more than ever, if you haven't. And incident command is a organized system of way, the way we respond to an emergency um, in a collective fashion assigning an individual, a single individual, as your facility leader um, in, the, in this um, uh, of the virus outbreak. So it may be the administrator, it may be somebody else in your organization, but the idea is they are called the incident commander and all things run through them. You cannot have 15 people making 15 phone calls on a single topic and getting 15 different answers and then trying to accomplish anything. A single person needs to be in charge of the facility's response. Now, within that, and as we talk about incident command, obviously you learn that incident command, it, you know, can can be a broader based thing based on the scale and span of the of the organization and of the disease. And so, for instance, in QSO 20-14, the the original SNC memo, it outlines a number of things that facilities should be doing and what CMS is expecting from us. And so, again, there should be one person in your organization who is implementing this based on the team of individuals who are being asked to work with them. Again, it's very similar to how we respond to any other event in our building. Think about how you respond to survey, for instance. When surveyors walk in your building, everybody does not go to the front door. Nursing assistants and dietary and housekeeping and our line staff continue working. It's three or four people. Again, the incident management team, the ITM, incident IMT, gathers and goes through and works with state surveyors as they were the incident. Well, this is the same situation. So in terms of your infection and disease policy, you know, in terms of how you're implementing the policy, again, incident command is the highest ranking person in the facility is responding to this urgency and it expands based on, on the severity. And so the opportunity there is, is then a single person based on management by objectives is going to then implement the facility's policy for infectious diseases. And then the separate to that is COVID. So you have an infectious disease policy because if you remember, if we go back and look at disaster preparedness, we had four major core elements, which was hazard vulnerability assessment, policy and procedures, communications plan, and training exercises. So you had to have a policy based on your hazard vulnerability assessment and if you did it correctly, you did it honestly, 
infectious diseases should have been in your, you know, top, towards the top of your most risky things in terms of things that are going to occur in your organization or things that may occur. Well, obviously it is occurring. And so then through the policy and procedures, through the communication structure, which uses instant command, you bring all this forward. So that's really where we are in terms of planning. So I'm hoping that most of you listening do not have cases in your building, that you're still in the planning phase. And I mean by planning and mitigation phase are things like screening, buying PPE, training staff, and preparing for what may either be the inevitability, um, but you know, what if happens? So yeah, certainly buildings like mine are in the middle of the response. And we're actually already talking about our recovery. Many of you listening might still be in the preparation and mitigation phase, which I'm hoping. And so that's where you're you're still in the planning phase. So this is why I, I want you to realize that in terms of the planning and organization and even the response, all of these individuals and all of this these these people and the resources that are on this slide are important to your planning and even the response to COVID. So you should have or should be considering touching these individuals within your organization and seeing where they stand or provide services relative to the response to COVID. And so, you know, again, incident commander can look at this and either, you know, ask these individuals personally or ask the operations person or somebody within the organization, reach out to this person. For instance, how many of you listening or you know watching this in your own minds are thinking, look at purchasing central supply. I mean, how many of you have gone to your purchasing person within your corporation, within your own facility, within your chain of facilities, and are begging for supplies, PPE, um, hand sanitizer, liquid soap, um, cleaning wipes, uh, whatever it is. But how many of you realize or recognize the need for supplies? And that, you know, how I many of you went out and bought toilet paper for your building because you were running out like the rest of America? Um, the same thing. So purchasing, transportation services becomes a, a, an issue. I understand, guys, <laughs> when you're listening to this, you know, how many of you have residents with dialysis? Well, believe it or not, residents with dialysis becomes a big issue in the COVID because there are, dial there are ambulance companies that will not transport your dialysis patients anymore if they've not been tested for COVID. I get the fact that it's discrimination. I get that it's probably illegal. And, but unfortunately, when the person sitting in your facility needing dialysis services really can't work through a complaint process with your state or federal OIG um, or, or even the Department of Health on discrimination. So transportation service, you may want to talk to your transportation companies of how they expect to transport your COVID cases. Uh, we did that here. We found out, you know, we had to do a number of things quickly. Um, and some of the dialysis centers don't want your patients either. They don't want positive cases. They want you to, they, so we had to find an isolation dialysis center um, here in the Miami Valley, which we did. And my, my one dialysis patient, even though he's negative, is going to that center because this building has so many positive residents. So there's a lot of people to talk to um, in this situation. Um, and I, you cannot underestimate the effort that goes into this. So the I, in incident management policy, and what that is, incident management team, who are the four people who are going to get called in your organization that you want at the table when your first third shift nurse turns up positive at two in the morning and she's still working? That's who, that's who this person, that's who this list is about, guys. This is your, this is the AA team. This is your, your team of your four, three or four people who get called in every emergency and get on a group conference call and say, uh, you know, what are we going to do now? What are we doing about this situation? What are we doing about that situation? And this is, you know, I want you to have this for every situation, every emergency in your building, um, but we're talking about COVID. So who are the three or four people on your COVID IMT? It could be different than your normal team. I don't think it should be, but it can be. The idea is that incident management team is part of incident command and it's your key team. So incident management itself is this basic structure. Now, if you've worked in other organizations like hospitals or other first response organizations, it can be much deeper than this. But in terms of, of nursing home incident command and AL incident command, it's as, as deep as it needs to be. There's, you know, nine or 10 individuals that are tagged from incident commander to 
medical technical specialist to to you know you have your your four chief positions of planning, operations, logistics, and finance, and that's that's the most that's as big as it gets. I can tell you from my own nursing home today, I have one of these people in every one of these jobs right now. I need help as incident commander in trying to manage my staff and my PPE and my ordering and organizing the screening and you know taking of temperatures and looking at data um, and responding to the staffing needs. I need all hands on deck. And I have asked a number of my staff to act in these roles, which um, you know includes providing each of these people with a job action sheet, which is an incident command. And you know, we do, you know, we then we use some of the other forms, but we certainly talk and are, are, are transparent and I'm educating them and we meet. It's, it just changes your department head meeting on a daily basis from what would have been based on census and, op, you know, and uh, admissions and discharges and what's new in our buildings and what is broken to, okay, now we're talking only about COVID. <laughs> so it's, it's changed our morning meetings, but it's still the same, it's really the same mentality. It's just on a, you know, a very focused topic um, for, for incident command uh, versus our daily operations. The incident commander, you know, is in charge, is the leader, and this is really about leadership. Administrators who are listening, guys, you got to step up. Maybe it's not natural to you, but somebody is looking to you. Your organization is looking at you to stand up and make decisions. Who's doing what screening? What are your screening components? What are your policies about, you know, who implemented, you know, no dining? You know, how have you done all these things? Take somebody to make a decision. You can't be paralyzed by indecision. You have to stand up and do it. And who needs to do it? And it's management by objectives. You need to ask people, can you do X and then report back to me? You can't do it all yourself, not asking you to, but it's all about setting up a strategy, being a leader within your organization, because you're gonna be leading your staff through this in what is gonna be one of the most difficult scenarios in your career if you end up with an outbreak in your facility because it is it is scary uh, you have staff with fear you have families with fear you have residents who are ill you have less resources than you really want whether it's staff or with ppe or whatever and then you're having to you know figure out how to meter this stuff out and you're trying to figure out all of the aspects of your organization from not so it doesn't collapse I mean, let's look at the worst case scenario. Many of you watched the news last week um, on, on April the 8th, where the facility in California was evacuated when second shift staff for the second day in a row failed to come to work. You don't wanna be that facility, guys. You don't wanna be a facility that gets evacuated by the state because staff stopped coming to work. And remember, staff's a resource in this case. So the so leadership and your staff will stop coming to work, guys. I have lost 20% of my nursing staff because they've quit because of this disease. And I have another 30% of my nursing staff off because they have the illness. So we're running with 50% of our staff and I was not good to begin with. I mean, we were not optimizing our staff, you know, two months ago. So, so it is tough. All my management nurses are working the floor. My MDS nurse works the floor now. Um, you know, we, we, we are not worried about certain things that we would worry about on a daily basis, like our five-star rating and, and quality measures um, and infection control practices other than things related to COVID and MDS timelines and maximizing our opportunities for reimbursement for therapy services and that kind of thing. That all gets lost in the weeds when you're dealing with this as an, out, as an outbreak. Again, there's job actions, you know, the job action sheets, the, the different sections. I mean, my director of nursing is my operations chief. As much as I'm overseeing everything as an incident commander, she is still doing the scheduling and making sure that the operations, you know, are, are holding together. Um, I have schedules. I do things related to schedule, but she's my operations chief. My planning chief is now my my director of marketing and admissions. She's thinking ahead. She's working with my staff. She's looking at what we need in the future. She's also serving in my role as, as my uh, um, um, as, uh, uh, public liaison. So there's actually two roles. Logistics is for, for the getters. So they will find, distribute, work with me, work with our vendors to go get stuff. Deal with human resources is in this role. So 
So, I mean, and then we have finance with business office manager and she's doing a fine job of keeping track of things. Cause you know, one of the things I'm doing today is filling out a survey for my state on our increased costs related to this. So I'll be working with my office manager on some of those cost issues. Facility communications, again, you know, one of the key things to do as we're screening and talking about this is as leadership, you're, you're, you're screening your staff and you're, you're, you're also going to be um, um, monitoring the data of your residents. And so once you have people, whether staff or residents who are needing to be tested or close to being concerned about having the COVID, so they're suspected cases, you should know your state or your, your local county health department. I mean, you have to. In most states, the only way to get a test by your Department of Health for COVID is to go through your local counties. County health departments, county EMAs separately, are the two most important people and organizations we should be working with. They have been tremendous resources. They can help you get supplies for PPE, but they're also the ones who approve testing of your residents and staff. I have talked to my EMA, I'm sorry, I have talked to my health director um, or my director of nursing for my health department every day for the last three or three and a half weeks. I've talked to her twice today. Um, I will talk to her two more times, 10 more times today and 20 times tomorrow. They're the ones who I work with and you should know. It goes back to emergency preparedness and EO9, group working with groups and coalitions and EMA officials. So if you haven't done it now before, you've got to do it now. And then working with your state health department periodically, when you have enough of an outbreak, you will end up working with them as well, which I do, I have done. And then of course, if you're part of, you know, whether you're part of a American Healthcare Association affiliate um, or leading age affiliate, um, it's, it's, or, or assisted living affiliate, um, you, know, you need to be talking to your trade associations. They can be tremendous resources for you all. And so, so you know, again, facility communications, um, and accessing help um, is, is critical. And of course there's supply issues. And that goes back to my previous slide of knowing it, talking to everybody. I mean, it took a lot to get supplies last week. When my, when my outbreak grew past 20 individuals, I was begging, pleading, whining um, for anything. I needed gowns, I needed masks, I needed alcohol sanitizer, um, and it worked. I mean, I touched enough people and worked with enough people within my own company or within my county, within my state and within the country that was able to then deliver me a reasonable amount of supplies that I have today. I could still use things like, you know, spray Lysol type products um, and wiping type products like uh, antibiotic uh, wipes. Um, those two seem to be extremely uh, hard to find, but you know, all of this stuff listed here, guys, and many, many more are things you need to be thinking about. Again, incident commander should, you know, have somebody in charge of, of central supply of all of your supplies. But I mean, it, you can see my office, which you're not, you only see a window behind me. I am the central supply closet now. Part of incident command has taught me that I need to lock all of this stuff up and dole it out carefully. And so I am in charge of incident command and I am in charge of central supply now. And so I have boxes and boxes of gloves and gowns and alcohol, gowns of alcohol sanitizer in my office right now. Um, and so that when people need that, they come to me. because I do not want to use it inappropriately. I have no problem using it. I just don't want to waste it. Lockdown. I mean, many of you listening, we went through this process um, almost three weeks ago here where it's lockdown. We have a single entrance, a single entrance in and out of the building. No one comes in and out of this building other than through the front door. Everybody is screened for the temperature. Everybody is screened um, um, for the questions that we've been asking, whether you've traveled, which is not as important now, or whether you've been exposed to somebody who is positive for COVID. Now, that's a really good point to bring up. Exposure to COVID is different than being in the presence of COVID because exposure to COVID means that you have not had the appropriate PPE on when the person who may have COVID virus was in your presence. So exposure means that you could actually get it because your mouth wasn't covered, your eyes may not have been covered, you weren't wearing a gown, <coughs> or you didn't wear gloves. So but being in the presence of appropriately with PPE, gloves, 
eye protection, N95 mask, et cetera, does not mean you're exposed. It means you're in the presence of. And in the presence of is really not inappropriate or dangerous. Because if you're wearing PPE appropriately, it should be safe to be in the presence of somebody with COVID. So do understand there is a difference between presence of COVID virus individuals and exposed to it. Now, I have been exposed to it because when my department heads, half of which ended up getting positive tests back, um, we did have some moments where we weren't wearing masks in department head meetings three weeks ago. Um, and so I would, didn't even know they were, they were positive until testing um, occurred a, a, a few days later. So, but I had not gotten the disease and there's four or five of us at this point, knock on wood, um, that have not gotten it. But lockdown, again, um, has been another new aspect that I foresee actually occurring now for several more months as we go forward. And then, of course, along with lockdown is the screening. So, you, you know, at your screening site, single table, um, I man that now for 13 hours a day, roughly, or I have a receptionist who's managing that personally. And so they're taking temperatures, they're filling out my screening form. Um, we're making sure that they're using thermometers correctly and recording temperatures and recording any symptoms. Um, and then, of course, if anybody has signs and symptoms or if they have a temperature, it's immediately reported to me. As incident commander, I have asked staff to leave. I've denied people entrance. Um, and so it is It is times where you have to do that. So screening has been a big part of this process as well. And so I've explained staff screening. The biggest issue for staff screening, of course, here is my temperature that I recommend is picking 100 degrees only because it seems to me that taking temperatures is not an exact science and that 104 degrees seems to be, 100.4 seems to be fairly difficult um, to always ma manage. And so I just think a little bit lower is more prudent. So um, we just do it that way. But, you, you know, you can pick the temperature you want for your facility policy. CDC only picked 100.4, but we picked the one, I'm recommending one that's four tenths lower. But either way, either way is fine. Employee tracking, again, you, you as incident commander should be tracking your employee illnesses. I'm sure as administrator, incident commander, you're not used to doing this. Typically, maybe nursing department did this, maybe your HR. Of course, we probably didn't have the volume of call-offs that you, but you will get in an outbreak, but you know, you're recording all of this. And you know, the last bullet there is return to work, a proposed date to return to work. In the end, whether you're looking at the seven-day period since, since symptoms were were, were occurring or 14 days, um, and there's some difference in those opinions there, seven or 14, and the CDC may be looking at that. In the end, guys, what you're looking for is in no less than three days since there were any symptoms. And all standards that we're using, in the end, it's three days with no symptoms and no fever. And a fever still is defined as 98.6. So, so, and that's without medication. So, so yes, I mean, you can talk to your county about this. Every county may be different. Every state may be looking at this differently, but the most recent standard that we're using in my county is, you know, where they, they have to be off at least seven days if they have symptoms, um, the onset of symptoms. And if they, if they don't have any symptoms for, for at least three days, then they can return to work, but no less than seven days um, since, since the onset of symptoms. And that's, the basic standard um, to live by, I think. And that's what we're talking here in the end is the 72 hours either way, whether they were tested, whether they weren't tested. In the end, it's the last 72 hours before returning to work, there is no symptoms. And again, there's a CDC requirements there. Um, and again, it's up to your state that you're listening from. Some states have had little differing standards in this um, or expectations, but they're all, they're all relatively the same. Resident screening, again, is something that I did personally. Um, I look at my, uh, my uh, we use uh, electronic medical record, and I look every eight to 10 hours. I, I evaluate looking at data of temperatures, respirations, nurses' notes, looking for shortness of breath, looking for upper respiratory infection. Um, and again, almost, uh, uh, let's see, 17 or 18 days ago, 
I probably reported to my county that I had three or four people that I suspected having the COVID virus, and that's when they ordered my first tests. And so I had five tests originally, or six maybe, and then we started testing more, and then once I had an outbreak, you stopped testing residents, but we've tested, oh, I probably have tested in excess of uh, 50 of my staff, and again, I think maybe 25 of them have come back positive. But you know, we are looking at everyone. We were looking initially at any new admissions and cohorting those individuals and observing them isolated initially. And then, of course, once we had testing and positive tests, that became our total focus. And of course, we have not had an admission now in uh, probably two weeks. Yeah, it'll be two weeks tomorrow. So really, when the when the onset of the the outbreak uh, kind of leaped off, we did have one final admission. Um, and she is fine. So we, you know, we monitor everybody, but again, administrator, instant commanders, I'm doing this. You should be doing this. You should be looking at the data. Again, it forces you to work with your medical director. It makes you work with your county. You're engaged with these individuals. You're looking at the data. You understand what to be looking for and you're, and you're monitoring that you are monitoring that because in the, in the loss of my staff, who's ill, you know, I have had to you know, step up and talk to families and report to family, people's health condition um, and their data. So, again, it's really important to be engaged in this process. This is not something to be done from the sidelines. Again, you're on, you know, you need to be talking to your staff. This is, this is floor coaching. This is in, this is doing in services for your staff about the use of PPE, about the onset of the disease, about what COVID's doing in your facility or others. And all of that. So, so again, you need to be very, very careful. And then, of course, any rules or engagement issues relative to people going to appointments. I mean, I still have one resident going to chemo. I have one resident getting dialysis. And I had another resident going out to a pain clinic. So, you know, what are their rules relative to this? None of them have positive cases, but they're still concerned about when do they wear, what kind of masks do they wear? Do they want to be tested? I know my dialysis resident was tested and is negative. So, I mean, there was some questions about that. So, again, that's talking to folks and making sure they can still meet their appointments. And then some people just had appointments just canceled. Obviously, we've seen a number of situations where the appointment for the resident was just canceled uh, by the provider. And so the last section, of course, we're going to talk about today is, is a focused survey. Now, you know, one of the things that has occurred in QSO 20-20 for all of us is that um, the first part of this memo really relates to um, survey, ongoing certification surveys, enforcement actions, and such. And I would just tell you that if you are a facility that was caught in the, we got surveyed March 1st or the end of February, and so we're sort of either in an enforcement procedure um, or your date certain, or you're working on your plan of correction, et cetera, you need to be talking to your state agency about what they expect you to do. Because in all reality, at this point, um, it looks like all states have done this, is that um, survey and enforcement is currently suspended. So, in theory, um, you know, let's say it goes on for four weeks. So, if your ban on payment was going to be March the 5th and they suspended it, now it would be April the 5th, maybe. I have no idea how every state's going to do this, but the point is you need to be talking to your state agency. I know yesterday um, one of my clients asked me if I'm going to do their fire safety evaluation, um, and I I was reluctant because I typically do those, have to do those on site. And so the state agency has asked me to do their fire safety evaluation um, by, by records review only and then not do it on site. And so I will be, I'll be doing that. So that's, that's new uh, for me and for the facility. But so there's limited amounts of, of information going to your state agencies. But if you had survey, you know, you need to be talking to your state agency. But like I know, for instance, I mean, the building I'm sitting in, uh, we were due for survey. Our last annual survey was, was I think the exit date was January the 28th, 2019. So obviously, by April 28th, um, was they were we were due for survey by 15 months. Um, we'll obviously pass that date, so we will be over 15 months between annual surveys. Um, and at this point, you know, we don't know when our survey is going to be. Uh, whenever this national emergency and the lifting of of these type of things um, it occurs, but. The other half of the memo is there is a specific COVID-19 focused survey. Some states are using this. Some state agencies are 
doing the investigations relative to COVID, see if the facility, you know, in an outbreak, for instance, um, is, has done all it can do to reduce the spread, uh, can protect its residents and its staff, um, and is following the guidelines that set up. So, one of the reasons we're doing this webinar and one of the things that has occurred in my own building is that we were preparing for them to show up. Um, they have not shown up at this point, um, but I don't think that's over yet. Um, I do have one of the largest outbreaks in Ohio at this point, and so I do feel um, some pressure to make sure I am prepared, which is probably one of the reasons um, we have my examples of my policies, um, because I thought that was important. Um, and, you know, I did follow the checklist that we're going to go through, because one of the things the focus survey offers us and what CMS would like all of you to do listening and otherwise um, is to go through the checklist. So the survey points, the seven points we're going to talk about are also the checklist for, for us to, to answer affirmatively um, in our own organizations. And so I would, I would, I would uh, strongly advise you uh, to do such a thing. So again, I mean, before we even had survey or before we even had COVID, infection control was the number one citation in this country. So imagine the focus that we're gonna have going forward when we have surveys in the future. Uh, the desire for us to maintain infection control standards is gonna be utmost important um, for many of us for many, many years to come. Um, again, the COVID virus uh, may not go away. Um, it may never go away. So the, until we have a vaccine and treatment, um, it may be around um, as we may having to manage this process and this virus for quite a while, which will obviously affect our operations going forward. So, you know, they talk about the process within the building, the developing policies and procedures to prevent the development and transmission of all communicable diseases, but this is going to be related to COVID. So this is for COVID care. Screening of our residents and our staff, and then what are that? And again, you're going to see a lot of available information that is out there. Well, again, this is provider enrollment um, information relative to the state memos. You can always get QSO memos um, online. Uh, you can just type in the words in Google. You type in survey and certification memo CMS, and it'll take you directly to that site. And then that's where they're not called QSO memos, but they were called survey and certification memos. Um, but you can you can follow and get these. And you'll see there's there's many many memos related to COVID for all of the various um, provider types. So this is the the most uh, I've ever seen. But there's some for hospitals, some for renal dialysis centers, some for outpatient rehab, and then of course we have our own SNF memos or nursing facility memos. The off-site survey, again, the COVID survey, they'll be gathering information, looking at your, your uh, last couple annual surveys, whether you had infection control issues, and they very, very well, may very well be calling you. And as incident commander, you would manage this. They may call you and ask you for policies. They may ask you for how you order PPE, who's your suppliers. They may ask you for all kinds of information um, over the phone to be sent to them, like policy and procedures, like copies of in-services you've done and educated your staff on. You know, what have you done relative to the COVID virus up to this date? So they may be asking you for information off-site with no one showing up. The on-site survey may be one, maybe two surveyors come into your building, and as you screen them, as they come in the building, make sure your staff offer them, if they don't have it apparent, um, PPE. Like for instance, if a surveyor walked in my building today, I would offer them a, an N95 mask automatically. All my staff wear N95 masks all the time. And so don't be the building that thinks their state surveyors aren't the same as the rest of all the visitors because they absolutely do and they would need to be educated. I would do that, reminding them if they're in the presence of a resident with the COVID positive virus, they would have to wear eye protection, a gown, N95 mask, and gloves. Period. Everybody. I mean, it's it's the same for all of us. So, so then they would, you know, obviously all these resident observations are listed on site from how we're interacting with residents. Are we wearing PPE? Are we donning it appropriately? Are we doffing it appropriately? You know, is there signage around the building? Um, hand sanitizer use. 
washing of hands, asking staff, is there enough supplies? Do they know where to get it? Are they using it? Notification of, of health officials. I mean, I have several ring binders of, of information and data and copies of emails showing my interaction with the various and sundry individuals um, that have and this has taken place. So, so yeah, on site would be like any other survey, just can be focused circling back to the COVID virus. And again, you know, adhering to the guidelines. I mean, how are you managing? So there's no law that says you have to follow every guideline, but if you're not following that guideline, then how are you doing it? What are you doing to be equally protective? So, so guidelines or recommendations, but in the end, you know, what is what is being done to protect residents and staff from community spread, or how are you caring for people who have it? And again, facilities has a, the facility self self assessment aspect of this is taking these seven areas and then answering these things for yourself without a surveyor there. You know, so what are you doing? You know, are you are you you know what are your standard precautions? How are you doing hand sand or hand hygiene? Use of PPE, and transmission transmission based uh, adherence. Try not to not try not to. Um, um, allow community spread within your nursing home. So what are your precautions? How are you doing you know, those things? So those, how are you doing that? What are your written policies on that? And then what is your patient care needs? What is your infection control standards? What were already your infection control standards? And then how are you add to that based on COVID? And then what is your visitor screening policy? You know, who are you doing? That's why you have policies on that. And your education and staff. I mean, do you have documentation showing staff education? How far back did it go? For me, for instance, my first in-service, in on COVID for my facility was back, I think it was February the 6th, when I did an in-service on the fetching control and mentioned the COVID virus and the use of PPE appropriately and stay tuned. And I've done that three more times or four more times since this has occurred. But you're doing that education, even if you've not done it in the past, I mean, what are you doing um, now? What are you doing to have staff in services and education um, for for that, have you shown staff how to take stuff on donning and doffing? Um, do you show them where the stockpile is in your facility? How do you how do you use it? And then staffing in emergencies. And there's a policy we provided on staffing. You know, again, who's doing what? How are you staffing your departments? How are you? I mean, like last weekend, I was in housekeeping. I have staff coming in seven days a week, covering for other staff uh, because a number of people. Um, on my on my employees have gotten the COVID virus. And so <clears throat> we've had to cover staffing. So how are you doing the staffing? You're using agency staff, contract staff, your own staff, company staff, other facility staff, I mean, whatever. How are you planning the staffing this, staffing this emergency? Um, again, the, the facility surveyors in the same way are going to evaluate your overall effectiveness of all these things. So again, the same the same seven bullets, but in terms of surveyor, it's always, you know, did you did you meet compliance wise? Are you in compliance with the minimum standard? Again, a little different bet, but the same idea holds true. And then again, they're gonna look at your surveillance plan, your screening policies, your screening practices, you're gonna look at your ring binders on temperatures, how you sent people home, they'll interview my receptionist as much as they'll interview me about it. But the idea is, you know, they're going to review all the different moving parts and it's constantly moving, constantly moving. I mean, if the final the final rules or the final guidance on this has not been drafted yet because we are learning this constantly about this virus. So the first piece is standard standards, transmission based precautions. Again, donning and doffing, where, where do you have the materials? Uh, stored, how do the staff put it on and off? How do they use it? You know, how do they clean it? You know, again, you know, I, I've hung, for instance, I have, I have places in the building that have clothesline where we hang um, our, our, our PPE uh, that we're not discarding, that we're letting it dry out if it's moist at all, uh, but we're trying to reuse it. So you're trying to have a policy on, on the reuse of what was you know, disposables, but now we're saving them. So, you know, you know, whether it's masks or gowns or eye protection, you know, how are you cleaning it? How are you maintaining it? It's going to become an issue um, and all of this stuff. Again, the things that are underlined, in the, the last bullet, again, if you have a suspected case or positive case, you have to wear the eye protection, the mask, the gown, and the gloves. 
And if you have it, the hair protection and the booties. So, I mean, a lot of PPE, it's hard sometimes to find. It is sporadic in this country. Um, but again, you have contact precautions, droplet precautions, airborne precautions. And then the worst case scenario is suspected cases of COVID require all of it. So again, what is your process? What is your practice for managing the, the supply of that and the use of those supplies? Obviously, second thing is resident care. How are you dealing with people who are suspected of the disease? How are you managing those individuals? Who are you talking to? Who are you reporting to? You know, again, then once you have a positive case, are you isolating them? Are you wearing the right PPE? Are you doing the social distancing? All of that. So resident care. I mean, the first thing is isolating. Are you moving them to an isolation wing unit? Because I understand you're not just discharging them to, the nurse, to a hospital. Many of you know that you can't just send people to a hospital because maybe our hospitals are full. And the reality is, is that people can power through the COVID virus um, on Tylenol and fluids anywhere um, and does not require necessarily hospitalization. Hospitalizations is where you get the complicated cases needing respiratory therapy, respiratory interventions, and of course, ultimately, in some cases, ventilator care, which many of you probably don't do in your center. Obviously, then, of course, you know, how did you implement the, the canceling of resident groups and, you know, dining and what are you doing for your residents? So what kind of activities are you doing? How are you meeting psychosocial needs of people and your residents? Have you changed your care plans? Um, are residents at all dissatisfied? Are they depressed? You know, I mean, it goes to the issue of about window visits and all the other things that we've been doing on on social media and, and talking on the phone to staff and residents, I mean, residents and their families. So again. How are you managing resident care? Um, <clears throat> residents who are leaving the building, how are you arranging for transportation? How are you managing their appointments? And all, all that. Three is the infection control standards. Again, relative to all infection control standards are important, but it kind of, kind of boils this down just to the COVID virus um, and how are you doing that? Four is infection control surveillance. Again, as I said earlier, I'm tracking my residents and my staff personally, making sure that you know I understand who we should be looking at, who should be getting tested, who should be in the isolation area. You know, what are we doing relative to that, um, and, and trying to keep track of all of that for my staff. Does the plan include early detection? Again, again, understanding what the signs and symptoms are, working with your medical director on what they would expect you to be tracking. Again, talking to your county officials. Um, about um, the disease and when they want to be notified, when they would order testing appropriate for your, your state and your organization. Visitor entry, again, visitor entry has become a huge issue. I will tell you there's two building, two residents, families in this building today. Um, residents who are end of life, dash end of life, truly end of life. Um, I will not let anybody die alone. I will not, that will not happen on my watch. And so I do allow families to be with their loved ones, maybe one person at a time. They're in the room, they're totally, all the PPE, so they're gowns and masks and, and screens, um, and, but they, they do come in. But, you know, what is your procedure on that? What is your, what is your individual facilities feeling about that? Um, I had spoken to my doctor about this. I had talked to my organization about this. They supported this. We'll continue supporting this until we're not permitted to, um, but it's not been a problem. Again, my, my, my families are very respectful of this, and I've not had a family member come in who is ill in any way. No, we're not going to allow ill family members in here, but a well, well person can come in here and visit with somebody who is, who is literally dying from this disease. So, but I mean, are you doing all your vendors? How are you doing deliveries? How are you doing your ambulance drivers? Who are you doing for therapy staff, lab, x-ray? I mean, there's dozens of visitors in our organization, guys, um, not just families. So, so you have to you know, manage that whole visitor entry process and the who and the when and the how. And then education, monitoring, screening, you know, educating your staff. You know, you know, when do you wear face masks? When, you know, I mean, for instance, I did an in-service there day for my staff that when you go home, when an employee goes home, including me, I go home, I close my garage door and I strip. I 
take off all my clothes and I put them in, in, in my laundry bag or in a laundry basket. Um, I, you know, and then I have to put all that stuff in the laundry. So everything all I'm wearing goes in, into the, the washing machine. And I take a shower. Try not to touch anything in your building or in your house. I mean, because I mean, we, we at home now are trying to manage, you know, not trying to track the disease. I mean, because in the end, as much as I'm using and washing my hands and sanitizing my hands, you never know who or what you touched on a daily basis. And so we're trying to at my own house. And I would tell you for all of your staff, they should be trying not to take it home, not to have the spread. I mean, it is, is, it is unparalleled in our careers, but it was something that you didn't need thinking about. So education, monitoring, screening of your staff. Because as I said at the outset, you do not want to take and have this case, a single case in your building. You never want to do that. And I can't say it will all be successful, but you want to try to limit an outbreak in your building. And then lastly, staffing. And there's a whole process on staffing. I mean, how you're going to staff with agency, your own staff, your company staff, who's going to do what, when, where, and how, but you need staff. You know, who's like my social worker has been out for two weeks. So who's doing social services? I'm not talking just about nursing. I mean, I have all of my housekeepers are out with the disease. Three, two out of my three activity staff, my HR person, my business office manager was out for a while. So, so who's doing what, when, and how is relates to all of the functions within your organization. So again, staffing plan um, becomes important. Who can work when, um, and again, other than licensed staff, all of us can work in the kitchen, all of us can do activities, all of us can do social services. Um, I mean, calling families and working with residents through their problems. So, and their and their questions and their concerns. So, so the staffing becomes extremely important. Um, these are the policies I believe that at at a direct supply tells you had have examples of or download these. Um, there is a a, a checklist uh, in the database for these. So you're certainly welcome to these, um, and we certainly encourage you to look at these um, policies and adopt adapt them for your own organization going forward because this is something that is is not going to go away and that that again these are all just in addition to your facility's current uh emergency preparedness plan so make sure that they don't conflict or in some way add additional um, expectations that you we're not comfortable with so you have to spend a little time individualizing these for your center i certainly appreciate um, the opportunity today to be with you all on um, the last four slides um, are just going to be uh, places where you can get more information. There is no lack of recommendations and concepts out there for you all to be to be uh, 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 reading and reviewing and making decisions based on. So this one's like PPE and face coverings. This is on infection control and healthcare. This is healthcare personnel issues. And the last one is facility-based long-term care services and supports. Again, there's a ton of information that you can access and read. I mean, you could do this the rest of your career, I think, just read about COVID-19, <laughs> but you might not want to do that. But I certainly appreciate the chance to be with you all today. Uh, if you have questions, please send them to webinars at directsupply.com. Um, those of us here at Direct Supply um, will be working with me on trying to collate the questions, we anticipate several people asking the same question twice, so we'll collate those, and I know that at some point, the TELS staff will be reposting the answers to the questions so that um, it'll kind of go out as another direct email or somehow you'll be able to, to circle back and get that. So I certainly appreciate the opportunity to be with you all today. And I hope you guys uh, have a very successful uh, COVID uh, virus um, uh, remediation and or um, um, don't get it in your building. So thank you very much. So much, Ken, for that amazing information and for taking the time out to give us all of that great advice. Um, I will be um, manning the webinars at directsupply.com, just like Ken said, to get all of your questions answered. Now, for anyone interested in learning more about how Direct Supply can help, please help me welcome Dustin Pesky. Thanks, Savannah. And I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Again, Ken, I cannot state enough how much we appreciate you and your time that you've taken out 
not just as an industry expert, but as an administrator to spend some time with us. And I do want to let you know, um, those that are still viewing, this is not the time for promotion. This is the time for policy information and action. And my goal over the next few minutes is to help you navigate the platforms that are direct supply um, so you can better understand and better find information and resources available to take action today on all the great advice that Ken and others have shared through us. So those of you that, that know, Direct Supply has a 30 year, 35 plus year history with the senior care, senior living industry. It is all we do. And as you care for residents, we care for you. That's our sole responsibility and goal and focus, um, specifically in these times of greater need. Um, and here at TELS, that's no different. Um, within TELS, we have over a network of over 13,000 providers like you that utilize our online platform, take advantage of the expertise and engage in growing and, and pushing the industry forward with these resources. And I wanna quickly make available to you information, tools, and resources that can help you respond in this time of need. So whether you're a TELS users or not, I promise you'll find value in free resources that you can access today. First, for those of you on TELS, again, TELS is a great way to take this policy, procedure, and regulatory guidance and really implement and take action within your organization or communities. Specifically, first within the TELS training tab, you're gonna find a variety of COVID-19 specific resources. So as you enter TELS at a building level, on the top bar, the blue bar, you're gonna see a couple different tabs. The last of those will be training. Click that tab, access this information. One of the things I really wanna point out, not only has Ken been preparing for this webinar, caring for his residents, but somewhere in the last week plus, He's had the time to create an emergency preparedness manual specific to COVID-19 response. It's over 100 some pages long, and you'll find that in the training tab as of today as well. Um, additionally, there's gonna be a variety of e email or information available from CMS, from CDC. Some of the industry information that's out there is best, best practice curated by Direct Supply Tells. A lot of it's gonna be regulations and policies, so you can quick access versus searching online. Um, go to the training tab, take advantage of these resources, leverage them for your success in your buildings. The most actionable thing that we could do as a business though in TELS is to take advantage of the site visit functionality that we have to create checklists specific to COVID-19 specific resources. So you'll see on this screen, we're highlighting two individual COVID, or excuse me, templates, checklist templates that are available today for a community or corporation to customize, um, push out across your organization, standardize on an approach to response. And as Ken said, if you're in the midst of, of a COVID-19 positive outbreak right now, take advantage of this to take action. If you are not, take advantage of this to prepare and create policy so you can respond as quickly as possible. The benefits to these, and you'll find one for separation units in the development of such um, as mandated as of last week, April 2nd, um, or excuse me, recommended, not mandated. And then also the, there's another on the CMS focus survey um, that highlights the seven sections Ken's walked through as well. The goal of these checklists is that you have the ability to customize this to your organization. Um, in, lacks of written, or in lieu of written policy, you have the ability to go to TELS, take what's available for best practice or guidelines, and create your facility or organization's response to that. Then as an administrator, owner, regional, corporate um, entity, you can push that out to those that do, your maintenance director, your infection preventionist, preventionist and have them act and mobilize now. Not only is it mobile optimized to, to be implemented out in the field or in your buildings, wherever you are, um, it also enables action and documentation. Specifically, there's three main sections um, to this different group. There's section headers, which as we noted, there's seven for the COVID uh, CMS focus survey. Um, underneath those are gonna be individual steps or tasks. Those can be responded on with a simple positive up, a thumbs up or a negative thumbs down as to your response to it. You can include notes, you can include photos, you can dispatch work orders to your staff, you can dispatch out to the TELS building service network for service provider support, or if required, you can track back to capital budget the things that need to get changed. Once complete, your building will receive a visit summary or a PDF of the response of that survey, um, excuse me, of the checklist. So whether it's a separation unit or focus survey um, template, you're able to actually have post uh, completion documentation that you can send, share, and warehouse for anyone that's interested or for additional communication across your facilities. So if you're a TELS user, take advantage of this great information, this great tool today. It is the most actionable way 
to get to a more appropriate COVID response. How do I access it? Well, if you're a corporate or regional folk, you've had access to site visit tools in the past. You can access this the same way. So on your dashboard, what I want you to do is click on the tile in the upper left uh, corner that says site visits. That's going to take you to the repository of all the site visits underneath your jurisdiction. So your regional, all those buildings within your region. In the far right, you're going to see a button that says create site visit. That allows you to open a third screen, um, the last one in the bottom, which brings a pop up up that allows you to select the community that you're in and implement against this checklist. So this is about how do we actually take our customized, our corporate approved checklist, created intels, and get our building users to take action. This is the route that you can take to get there as you're on site. If you're in a facility, we've opened up access to this um, so that you can take advantage of these actionable tools as well. Um, as you enter TELS, you probably have noticed or will begin to notice there's a new pop-up that shows up. Anyone that has more than work order only access, so anyone that's not your dispatcher or a receptionist who's triaging your work orders, they'll have access to this pop-up, which means that they can go in and customize, create, or implement against the, the COVID-19 separation unit or COVID-19 CMS focus survey checklist. Um, click the here, how to create a site visit template for more information or click get started to get started. Again, TELS has had a great opportunity to be involved for multiple de uh, decades now with the senior living environment. Please take advantage of the 13,000 service provider, excuse me, skilled nursing provider network that we offer. If you are not a part of TELS today, it's a very low monthly fee. Contact your account manager or request at TELS.net for more information. If you are and you're having troubles finding this information, contact your TELS CAM or TELS sales representative or email request at TELS.net to gain access to these very crucial action-oriented tools. Lastly, as noted, I wanna talk across our platform. So even if you're not a TELS user today, you still can access this information. You can still take advantage of the expertise provided by Ken, CMS, CDC, and others, and really find the, the right way to help fight COVID-19 in your facilities. Um, on our direct supply network net, uh, platform, which is the e-commerce or ordering platform you probably interact with on a daily basis today, you may have noticed that we've created a COVID-19 specific landing page. This week, we've revamped that to bring focus to specific sections. We've got an area that really highlights what our supply chain team is doing as far as product availability and those most relevant to this, um, this virus and, and this disease. Um, we have a, a section that's specific to the industry resources. So all the guidance coming from CMS, from CDC, you'll find those linked here as well. And then as we create blog posts, webinars, other informational sessions like this, um, we're putting that in our ideas and expertise. Really, what we're trying to do is reference and utilize our position in the center of the senior living marketplace to help you take advantage of the best practice of others in the quickest, easiest way we know how. Um, you'll see I put a representative of the COVID-19 focus survey guidance from CMS. That information is linked out in the industry resource tab today. Along with that, I did just want to highlight some of the things that are being going on internally with product availability. Our supply chain team has jumped into action and our e-commerce and marketing teams have responded as well to support your needs and what they're doing. We're looking at the crucial supplies required across the, the industry for this pandemic. And every day we're facing new challenges, things we didn't think we'd think about, like zip walls and, and visqueen plastic for our separation walls, um, down to new technologies for disinfectant based on the availability of others. But the best way to access that information today is by going to the Direct Supply Network, visiting this landing page, and you'll find on the um, website itself, we've pulled products that aren't available. So if you're searching for Gojo or Purell hand sanitizer, you might not find it because it may not be available today. Uh, we don't want to present something to you that you can place an order for and then wait for weeks in order for it to respond. We've also included in red, as you see bolded on the right side of my screen here, shipping or distribution information to let you know real-time lead times, so up to the day availability of what products are accessible and what are not. So as you go through the process of trying to source these, we're trying to make our site as easy to navigate and as user-friendly and valuable as possible, um, as that's our opportunity and responsibility. And the last thing I wanna highlight is the opportunity to gain more information. So we talked about the COVID-19 landing page. We also have a great blog, Direct Supply Insights, that I've listed a link on here as well. This webinar, along with its partner, um, phase part one, which is on separation units and the development of, are going to be available in short order, probably by the time you're viewing this, um, on the blog as well. And the difference between the flat linked out um, 
access you'll find from our COVID-19 landing page is when we break these down into our blogs, we generally do it in a little bit easier to follow format. So instead of having to view the entire presentation, we're gonna break it down into smaller digestible chunks for you to view. That said, I just wanna say we really appreciate, Ken, everything that you're doing um, and the support you've offered us over the last week to build this content. Um, for everyone else that's out there, it's been a pleasure to be a part of the industry and support you. Down your PPE, keep your hands washed, and stay safe. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dustin, and thank you again, Ken, for all of that wonderful information, and we hope you all have a great day.